you'll find your hymn books, turn with me to number 218. Number 218, God leads us along. I was thinking about that chorus a little bit. Uh, there's some, some great truths there that I'm sure that, that many of us and probably all of us if we think about it a little bit can relate to uh, some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some of us uh, can say that I've felt maybe this week like you've been through a fiery trial. Or maybe you've uh, felt somewhere along the line, maybe Brother Tom can testify to this, where he's felt like it's been an overwhelming flood to be able to have to ask the Lord to bring you through. Think about those things in your life whenever you sing this. And remember that one phrase there, all through the blood. Nobody gets to God but through the blood. Think about that. God leads us along. Some 
Well, it's nice to, if you don't think that you're, um, if you're younger and you don't think you're going to be a grandparent someday, um, it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. I was just uh, <clears throat> sitting there watching uh, my wife back here in the back and hold one of her grandbabies and remembering the day and the time when those were our babies. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like that long ago uh, that we were doing just that, mama walking around. And now it's the uh, next generation, isn't it? The next generation start. What a blessing for us, uh, for me anyway, a blessing to have, um, like I said before, all our kids here this morning. And we, uh, I know that you could probably ask the kids growing up, uh, did you generally miss a Sunday? They, they'd probably tell you not, not very many, not very many there most of the time. So uh, as they get older, though, and they start scattering and doing different things, and for you all to be together, it's, it, it's not like it used to be. So it's a true blessing this morning to have uh, each one, each one here. <clears throat> um, if nobody else is blessed by it, I am truly blessed by it. Uh, Amazing, our God, and bringing us together. And uh, I thank Him for my wife and our family. Um, a lot of that's due to the time spent right there with her. Daddy didn't do that a lot. I did that once in a while, but Mama did that uh, holding that baby dear a lot. And I missed out on a lot of those years. Uh, but I still try to hold them. I remember them too. Um, Anyway, <laughs> it's time, time for us to uh, move on, but uh, love my family, love each one, and uh, uh, so thankful that they're here. Um, not only um, the girls, but uh, that Kelly's whole family is here, and, and Chrissy, and the uh, fellow that she's looking at, like I said, I'm, I'm still telling you, you need to evaluate him, but <laughs> so glad that they're here and that that, that Jake is here too. We've got to know him a little bit uh, the last uh, uh, month or so, and uh, we've been encouraged by the time that we've all had. And uh, I have to say that uh, uh, with uh, with Joe as well. You know, he's been uh, uh, him and Caleb are going to be working together. So I'm going to, you know, I'm kind of turning some of those fatherly reins over to. My son-in-law. So you got to do a good job, Joe. <laughs> you got to kind of take up and kind of lead him there. Well, you guys are working together, but um, you know a lot of you know history and stuff. But I um, haven't said this a lot openly before. It might be hard to say, <laughs> but I want to. I want to say it because it's on my heart. The Lord wants us to share our heart with one another and I wouldn't change anything that we've done as a family I mean there's we make mistakes you know but we grow through those mistakes and I just wouldn't change any of that but I got to tell I got to say something here and it's and it's it's really to Joe and I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for a better son-in-law than Joe. I wouldn't, you know. I go back to the history of some things starting there. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for anybody greater. He's, he's a man that's going to lead his family. I know it. I know that that's where God's called him. But you know, I, I could have evaluated it, and I did do evaluation of Joe in the beginning, and, you know, are you going to measure up? You know, just like I said, you know, you need, to, you need to take a look at Jake here. Are you going to measure up? But I could tell you without a doubt, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for any other son-in-law. Joe's my son-in-law, and I love him, and I love his family, and I love who they are. And it's a great blessing for each one. 
to be here with us today. And I praise the Lord and I give Him glory and I give Him the honor for all of that, for what He's doing and working. So, thank you. Appreciate your family. Appreciate those that are with you and capitalize on the time that you have with each one because remember, remember that there are only a few things that are eternal. God's holy word is eternal. In our relationship with people. People. But you know we spend great amounts of time. In other avenues and other pursuits don't we. But the things that are eternal. The people we need to be spending time. One with another don't we. With all that that wasn't the introduction to the message. But I want to share my heart too. I want you guys to be able to have the freedom to share your heart. Because it greatly encourages each one of us. Um, I, I take, if you would, the Word of God this morning. And if you, would, if you don't have one with you, there is a Bible in the pew. God wants you to open it. And He wants you to look at the Word of God because that's where the power is. The power, the power isn't in my voice. The power isn't in the things that I say. But the power is in the Word of our God. And that's why it's so important for you to open the Bible. Psalm 131 is the area that we want to go to right here this morning. Psalm 131. I can... I talked with the, some of the men. I, I don't remember who all they were on a Thursday night when we were doing... Bible study a little bit and um, we were talking about Psalms a little bit and I was reading through them I know Brother Lee's read through them and at times has a hard time understanding some of the Psalms and get frustrated with them and I'd kind of been going through a little bit of that myself I'm, I'm reading through the Psalms and I was finding I was reading and I was reading but I wasn't understanding some great things that God wanted me to have but he took me to Psalm 131 and that's what we're going to look at this morning. And he also took me to Psalm 128. Well, Psalm 128, I think he's given a message for Father's Day. So be ready, man. Be ready for what God has for you on Father's Day. Because we did get the ladies a little bit on uh, Mother's Day, didn't we? So be prepared. But Psalm 131, uh, a psalm of David. One of the uh, songs or psalms of degrees. And what a, what a great what a great psalm it is and speaking about the life of David I think in many aspects uh, from him being young to older age and I appreciate the song Kaisers that you picked here because I think a lot of it speaks to a lot of the things that uh, God would have us in this in this psalm right here I, I think a lot of great truths from it right here and it's amazing the Holy Spirit working in each one of us to bring together a service I don't do everything for this service. There's many people that have different things that they're doing. And we can see the Holy Spirit leading in, in those things. And that encourages my heart too. But here we've got David. You know, I think as, as we were singing this, God leads us along. I was wondering, that should have been placed in the Psalms maybe. I wonder if David wrote that. But I read here it, was, it wasn't David that wrote it. But a lot of... A lot of the heart of David I could see coming out in that, in that uh, hymn that we, that we sang together. What a blessed hymn. If you think back to David's life, I struggled with David for a lot of time because he was an, seemed like an immoral man too. But yet, he was a man after God's own heart. But it just shows a picture of us that we sin. But David was always a man that made his relationship with the Lord right. Through the blood. Right? Like Brother Kurt Stress said up here. It's through the blood. Through the blood of the Lamb. Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he shed for us that we can be in relationship with him. And that's the greatness of what David found. But we know that, you know, being a young man coming from the sheep folds of taking care of the sheep. Right? Into the great spot of being king as being a young man but yet even though he was king and he was anointed he had great respect for the king that was still there Saul King Saul didn't he and he didn't do want to do anything to hinder what God was going to do with that man in his place and he respected 
King Saul greatly. You know, he went from taking care of sheep to being Saul's armor bearer. And not only that, you know, the, the Bible says that David actually as a young man took on a lion and what else? A bear. He took on a lion and a bear and single-handedly took them on to protect the sheep out in the field. I would have loved to have been there to see the power of God working in him, taking on the lion and the bear. What a great feat. But not only that, you know, when everybody else was afraid of Goliath, who was it that stood their ground and went forward with a sling and some rocks in his hand under the mighty hand of God? It was David, wasn't it? He slayed, slayed the great giant, Goliath. David was also a great musician and played the harp, didn't he? Pinned many of the psalms that we have that we are reading right now and that we sing at times too. But you know, the greatest thing about David was he was a godly man. And he was a man that went from being a young man to being an older man. And he was a man that was growing in grace. Growing in God's grace. He was. And I think that's really what we're going to see in this Psalm 131 is some keys to really growing in grace. And we might... We might put another term on this, not only growing in grace, but we'd call it sanctification. After we've come to know the Lord as our Savior, growing in Him. Some keys for us to grow in the Lord are right here and the great keys that David found. And he, that was the man that he was. You see, it didn't matter whether David was through the waters, right? Or some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. His sorrows, God gave him a song. It was in night season or it was in the day, wasn't it? He relied upon the Lord in his life. So let's begin and read this psalm together and let's see some great truths about growing truly in God's grace. It says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. In reading that, you might say, I don't get a lot of growing in grace out of that. How do you get any growing in grace out of what's said there? Well, I want you to notice what's the first word that he uses. Lord, doesn't he? David says, Lord, my heart is not haughty. Lord, this is Jehovah, Lord. This is Jehovah. This is the God, the Jewish national God of Israel. When he says Jehovah, the Lord, God. That means the self-existent one, the eternal one. That's who David was acknowledging here, the Lord God. And I wonder, who would raise your hand and say you believe in God this morning? If you do, raise your hand. You do? Yeah, I think just about everybody raised their hand. But it isn't the God in the Bible, that's what I ask. There are a lot of false gods out there, aren't there? But David's God was the Lord God, the self-existent one, the eternal one, the one true God that we know consists of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the one true God that the Bible reveals to us. The Lord. But notice David says, my heart. We did a message not long ago. 
I kind of titled it the uh, Labob. <laughs> Brother Lee, it must have affected him. <laughs> he remembers the Labob. And we looked at the heart then too. And he, but he, David's talking about his heart again. Lord, my heart is not haughty. What, when we speak of heart right here, he's speaking of that place within the heart that generates sinfulness. Pride. I want to refer to it for David. It's the old man. It's the old nature. It's a sinful person. That's who he's speaking of. But you know, there's a change here in David's heart. Because notice he says, Lord, my heart is not haughty. It's not haughty. Which means prideful. If you don't know that, right? My heart is not prideful. It isn't prideful. So something had happened within his heart. He had a changed heart. You see, we know, we know that there's the old man. You see, if you don't truly know the Lord God this morning, Jehovah, the God of Israel, the saving God that the Bible talks about, the God of grace and mercy. You see, he was manifest in the flesh of a man, wasn't he? who we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He left glory. He came in the flesh of a man to take on man's flesh and to die in your place, in my place on Calvary, and to shed His blood like we said here. See, it said the song said again, God leads His dear children along, some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. I'm telling you, if you haven't come to Jesus as your Savior, there's only one way to get to heaven, and it's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because He came here in the flesh, didn't He? And He suffered and died on Calvary's tree for you and for me, and He died and He was buried. But you've got to understand, when He died and He was buried, He died physically and spiritually he faced the wrath of God and hell for you and me. He rose from the dead so that you could have life. He paid it all. He paid the price. You see, that's what David experienced with the Lord God, Jehovah, the God of Israel. A saving God. He changed his heart, you see. But even within the heart, the old man. There was a new man we see with David here. And that heart that we see with David right here was not haughty. Was not haughty. Have you come, again I ask you, to the true God of Israel? Have you come to a relationship with Him and been saved? You see, if you haven't, if something happens to you and you to die, you'd be separated from God forever. But He came to give you life. And He wants you to enter into that life today through the blood. Through the blood. So as we come, you see, David had every reason to be a prideful man. He did. Every reason. He came from taking care of sheep Anointed king as a young boy, young man, teenager, I believe was a time frame. Anointed to be the next king of Israel. And that young boy, I'm thinking maybe Kyler's age, Kira's age, right, right in that age frame, right there, 13, 14, 15. At that age, took on the bear and the lion. That's a marvelous feat. He could have been prideful and built up in that, couldn't he? Or his great ability to play the harp. That could have built up his pride. Not only that, but I think what would have built a little pride in me. Oh yeah, it would have. It would have been to have taken on Goliath. The nine foot giant. Or a little bit more than that, maybe. Right? That would, If I would have taken him on, he takes him on. Slays him, then he stands there, and what does he do? He takes his head, doesn't he? He does. And actually, we see him later on with the sword of Goliath. He ended up with this, using the sword of Goliath for something else later on. That's a different message. Right? Oh, I think that would have built pride for me. I would have thought that was my strength and my power that did all that. But that was his trust in the God of Israel. 
that gave him that great feat right there with Goliath. Saul's armor bearer, David, had every reason to be haughty. But it says here, Lord, my heart is not haughty. And I want to look at the first thing. If you take notes, if you look at inside that bulletin, there are some points under there under growing in uh, the grace of God in many ways. The first thing I want us to look at here, growing in this grace, is just that my heart is not haughty. I want you to think of this in a bad sense. Haughtiness in a bad sense first. Then I want to look at it in a good sense, like it was for David. The bad sense, you know the, the reality of it, that our heart is naturally prone, the old nature, to be prideful. It's within us. We want to be prideful. We want to be built up with pride. That's the old man. That's that nature. I feel it all the time. I do. I feel it all the time. You know, things that can build us up, Riches, can't they? If we have great wealth and great riches, it can build us up with pride. Honor. One that earns a position of great honor. Doesn't that person have to be careful? Oh, it could be prideful. I've seen several sheriffs that have come in Park County over the years when I was a policeman that actually pride in some of those things got them. Being built up with the position and the honor of the position. Birth and blood. I've got my, my kids are here this morning. They are my kids by blood, aren't they? You know, some people are born into blood, into that line of great wealth. Aren't you? I think of like the, isn't it the, uh, in England, the queen? Over, is it is Britain, right? The queen, how long have they been on the throne there? Carol says forever. But you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's through the blood, isn't it? So there is an heir, a blood heir, isn't there? He's born, they've been born into this honor and this position, right? And you know that can breed great pride in the lives of people. Or wisdom. You know, you might be granted with a great amount of wisdom. I'm not very wise, but you might have a lot of wisdom that you've been granted. That wisdom can lead you to being prideful, can it? Or knowledge. Somebody that's got a great depth of knowledge. Oh, it can lead up to pride, learning, education. You know, going on and learning and learning and having a degree, a more degree, a more degree. Great learning and great smart can lead to what? Pridefulness, can it? Not only, not only that, but... Uh, Strength. Strength. Being strong can do that. Can it? I kind of was built up with pride a little bit yesterday. I went, uh, I went down to Anderson's and visited with him a little bit. I'm going to put her on the spot. I'm gonna, it was kind of funny. that I got, I got to share it. I was visiting with Anderson's down there, and I was sitting on the couch there, and Renee just says, Kevin! You know, it's kind of like a, she said, you have some, I really not, not ever noticed before, but you have s muscles on your arms. <laughs> you, you've, got, you've got like muscles on your, on your arms. And, and then Tom, you know, is right there. Hey, hon. <laughs> no, no. Hey, you got some. So I go, I go home and I, I had to share a little bit that, well, hon, uh, Renee said that she noticed that I had muscles on my arms, you know? No, so I just, well, we can be built up, can't we? Strength, muscles are a sign of strength. So a little bit of pride there, right? Could fester up. Yeah, I'm, you know, one of the 
Shelly's co-worker says I, she was surprised when I was just in my 40s. Thought I was a little older, <laughs> older than that. So when you hear that you still have muscles, it can build you up with pride a little bit. So you gotta be, you got to be careful. Not only, not only strength, but beauty. Ladies that have, they're, they're beautiful, right? And, and that beauty, and, and you, you start getting the attention of people, and it can build you up with that pride, can it? That's all the, that negative side of it, isn't it? Well, we all got to be careful to have that heart, but it also speaks in a good sense. And I want you, I think this is David's heart when he says, my heart's not haughty. I think this, this is his heart. You see, you know what he was lifted up with? He was lifted up to God. His heart was lifted to the Lord, the God of Israel, the self-existent one, the eternal one. That's where he's lifted up, right? And when you're lifted up there, you know what? You begin to have a contrite heart like he had. You begin to see your sinfulness. You begin to see that you're a sinful person, aren't you? Utterly sinful. And you look at your sinfulness in light of God's greatness. And God's mercy and God's grace. And you can see that there's nothing good. You've got to come to this point and see this. There's nothing good in us. Only one thing. Christ in me, the hope of glory. All the goodness that you have is the Lord in you. So you come to that point in that place in your life that it isn't me because we want to say it's me. That's the haughty heart. Right? But when we come to the point to say, no, it's God in me, not me. It's God's power and might. You see, David, when he conquered Goliath, it wasn't him, it was God. When he conquered the bear and the lion, it wasn't him, it was God in him. And God got the glory, not David. So I ask you, a hindrance to your growth in grace is a haughty, prideful heart. If you truly want to grow in the grace of God, you truly got to come to that place where you see your utter sinfulness in light of the righteousness of an almighty God. If you, that's David saw it. David capitalized on it. Right here he did. Not only my heart is not haughty, but he goes on and he says, nor are my eyes lofty. Almost kind of the same, but it's different. Lofty eyes. You know, eyes tell a lot about somebody. They do. You know, I think law enforcement, Lee will have to correct me. I'm trying to remember back. But when you're interviewing somebody and they're lying to you, their eyes go to the left. Or is it to the right? Do you remember? <laughs> it's never any good at that. Well, some of the reading the body language and stuff, when you're interviewing people, an indicator of them lying, they'll look down, and I thought it was to the left, but it could be the right, but they look down one way when they're lying. Now start watching one another, right? When, when we're talking to one another. Oh, you're looking down to the right, you're lying, right? No, it's, it could be an indicator. <laughs> could be an indicator, right? Our eyes speak a lot. I was talking with a lady, uh, a young gal not too long ago, and in a relationship or beginning a relationship with a man and looking for some wisdom in those things. And I said, uh, there's one thing you want to begin to do. I want you to begin to look th at the eyes. And it's going to speak a lot about the man. Where, her, where are his eyes at? Are his eyes on you? Or do you see the eyes wandering to other people? Particularly, girls. That would be an indicator of where his heart is. That's an indicator of where the heart is. The eyes speak a lot. Well, here it's speaking of the lofty eye. Those eyes, those people that are built up with 
this pride, you know how they begin to look at other people? And maybe you've been in a place where somebody is like this. Let's take a rich person and let's take a poor person. The rich person comes in a room, recognizes, knows in his, he knows that there's somebody that's poor in there. But you know what they never do? They never engage that person. They walk right by him, lift their eyes up, act like they don't see him, but they've seen him. They know they're there, but they act like they're not there, and they walk by him. Who's seen that? Did he? Yeah. That's it. That's the lofty eye, isn't it? That is it. It could be the, the Bible talks about the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders, and the publicans, which were the tax collectors, or who they referred to as being sinners. And how did the Pharisees treat the tax collectors or the sinners? When Jesus sat down with them to share with them, they looked at him and said, well, why, Jesus, why are you sitting with tax collectors and sinners? You're better than they are. But he came to say, I, I came to save who? Not the righteous, but sinners, right? That's who I came to save. So he can be lifted up with the lofty eyes. And I gotta tell you, that character of lofty eyes is of the Antichrist. It's of the Antichrist. It is. It's a bad spirit. It's a bad direction. You know what God wants us to do, though? He doesn't want us to have the lofty eyes. Men, I'm speaking to you for a minute. Every one of the men in here, I'm speaking. Men, you're visual. And if you're married, your eyes need to be for your wife. Not for anybody else. Remember Job? Never sinned with his eyes. Did he? Never looked upon a woman. You men need to look on your wives. We need not look on another. Right? That's what God wants us to do. Our eyes speak our heart. God wants us to take our eyes, just like David did, and look upon the Lord God of Israel the self-existent one. And as we're raised up and we look at Him, He wants us to look at one another with a heart of love, a heart of compassion, a heart of knowing this. I'm not any better than you. Each one of us here, God's called us to different positions, different things that we're doing all around, but there's not any one of us in here that's any better than the other. There isn't. And that's, we need to look at one another just like that, don't we? I'm not any, I'm not any greater than you. You're not any greater than me. We don't want to be lifted up with lofty eyes. And it's a key. David saw that it was a key to his growing in grace. Lord, my heart's not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. And then the, the next thing. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters. That's the boasting side a little bit. Those accomplishments that David did, he could have boasted in them, couldn't he have? Hey, I took on Goliath. Did you? You know? Hey, I got him. Hey, I single-handedly slit the bear's throat. Have you done that? Huh? Have you done that? No. Well, you know, I, I was lifted up with this boastfulness just recently, and it wasn't the thing that Brene said. There's a couple other fellas in here that are guilty too, so I'm going to get them. <laughs> last, last weekend, we are at our house. We are all kind of, my mom and dad had left, and, and uh, Joe was there, and uh, Jake was there, and Caleb was there, and I was there. And Caleb said he works with this, works, well, he worked with this one fella, and they were talking about this other guy, uh, I think it was one of the herd boys, that, 
Well, he did this certain repetition with weights, and it was like 500 and some pounds. And Joe and I think Jake are sitting there thinking, they're like, that particular movement with weights, even the strongest of strongest guys aren't going to be able to do 500 pounds like that. Or, you know, that, that isn't possible. That's a lie. Whatever they're saying there is a lie. So, you know, that, then the conversation goes from there, and it, it goes like, I, I don't know if it was Jake or if it was, if it was Joe that first said, well, hey, I, you know, I used to bench press this much. <laughs> you know? And then, and then, the, and then hey, hey I, I used to bench press this much, right? <laughs> and uh, then I fell in. Well, you know, I'm the 40-year-old old man here. <clears throat> I used to bench press 300 pounds. <laughs> so, yeah, what was that? Where did that come from, right? Where did that come? That's that right there. I was being lifted up with, I was boasting about what I used to be able to do. It, it wasn't any goodness there, was there? I just wanted to, you know, take these young men and, yeah, I'm strong too. <laughs> My God. As, <laughs> I remember the one time with Joe, I don't know if he remembers this or not, but we were helping uh, load up that one couch that you've got. I don't know, I don't think it's got a, uh, like a, what do you call it, a bed in it? A hide a bed? I don't think, but that thing is heavy. It is. And, and, I, and I'm on one end of it, and I'm not doing very well on my end. <laughs> Somebody else has to help me <laughs> with my end to move this. And uh, Joe just grabs the other end and just picks it up like nothing. Humbling. <laughs> Humbling. But we've got to be careful, don't we? It's easy for us to move into that boastful heart and if we have that boastful heart like that, it hinders our growth in the grace of God. It does. And it hindered for a moment. I was there. I, I fell right into it. I did. Yeah. I think it happened just for this particular moment or this message, though. I'm going to use that. I'm going to say that's why it was, because God wanted us to hear it. He wanted me to see my heart. I had to see my heart. He wants each of us to see our hearts. But not only is this, neither do I exercise myself in great matters. David didn't take that boastful heart. Nor did he say that he knew everything in the Lord. You know, there's some people that know everything. They think they know everything. Right? But David's heart was, God, I'm always learning from you. And I'm not ever, ever going to be able to learn everything about who you are. I'm not. So that's the other side of that. And then I want to go on to four. I want to move because we're spending quite a bit of time here. And I don't want to lose you. Number four, is David says, I have behaved and quieted myself. He didn't have, my heart was not lifted, my heart's not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise my, myself in great matters, nor in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. David, that's what I saw in this song. This is what I saw with, with David right here in this song. I have behaved and quieted myself God leads his dear children along. You know, it didn't matter what circumstance it was in David's life. If you listen to his prayers, you listen to his words, he was relying on the Lord. Whether it was, I'm going to sing, and I won't sing it, I'll read it. God leads his dear children along, some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire. I mean, that Brother Kurt said that with Anderson's. There's been some fire there. But all through the blood. Some through the great sorrow. But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. That's what David 
entered into. It didn't matter what circumstance he was in his life. That's where he was. I, I want you to think about that. that. That means restlessness, turbulence that comes right in, in your life, upsetness, calamity, afflictions, troubles, right? When all those things hit, like they hit David, it was, he was able to behave and quiet himself looking to the eyes of the Lord God of Israel. That's a key to being able to grow in God's grace because we can capitalize, like I did for my boastfulness for a minute, on the calamity or the fire. And it's been brought to you to get your eyes off the Lord. Satan wants to use it. Your flesh wants to use it, right? Get your eyes off the Lord. We've got to put our eyes on the Lord. That's what David did, and it created quietness of his heart. Trusting in the Lord. And then the last, the last one thing that I want to see, I'll hit a point six, but he says, My soul is even as a weaned child. My soul is as a weaned child. We can really see some of this because we've got Caden that's near us. We see a child that is still nursing on mama. And I, I tell you, when he's hungry, he wants some milk. But doesn't he, Joe? <laughs> oh, yeah. When he's hungry, he wants some milk. And he'll fuss, he'll kick, he'll whatever he needs to do till he gets milk. Right? That we're satisfied with the milk. So I want you to, what, what David's talking about here, being weaned, being as a weaned child, his soul, is he had a time in his life when he was connected to the world. And the world gave him all his sustenance for life. Just like a baby is connected to its mama for milk, for sustenance. There was a time in his life when he was connected to all those things in the world. I want, I want you to think about some of these things. The riches and the pursuit of riches in the world. Right? Honor that the world brings. Great positions. Right? Great positions. Pleasures. The pleasures that life brings. Prophets. All these things profit my soul. They profit myself a lot, don't they? It can be self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. My own righteousness. My own dependence on me and my ability. My own dependence there. You see, there was a time in David's life when... He was connected to the world just like that, just like a baby's connected to its mom. And there has to, be, there has to come a time in your life where you're separated. You're a weaned child. That's what God wants us to move out of, being not connected to the world and the system of the world. But this is that point in time where there's full dependence on God in our life. Full dependence on God in our life. Not full dependence on my ability to earn money. Can't we get like that? It's me. It's me. It's me. No, it's God, isn't it? God's gracious enough to give you the job that you have. He's gracious enough to give you the family that you have. Total dependence on the God of Israel for grace and for strength, not on the world system. I saw a picture this last week, and I really liked it. I thought it illustrated this really good. And it was a picture of a guy walking. It's kind of like a dark room, but yet it's like the door was open, and there was light shining in. But the door where the light was shining in, it was a picture of a cross. And then as the room was dark, you could see kind of a shadow where it came down to where the man was walking. And he was facing the cross. 
And he was at just a distance to the cross that right behind him you could see a ball. And that ball happened to be a picture of the world. So what did he do? The world was there. He'd been connected, but yet he'd turned and he was walking in dependence upon God. I liked the picture. I thought it matched what the Bible said here. What David had to do, be weaned from the world and connected to the cross of Calvary. And then uh, to Andy, David says this, Verse 3 says, Let Israel hope in the Lord and henceforth and forever. I think I see a little bit of the gift that Shannon has. Shannon's an encourager. An encourager. One that comes alongside and exhorts you to try and get you moving along where you ought to be going. I think David's doing that right here. He's trying to exhort and encourage others along to the Lord God of Israel that he knows is the self-existent one, the eternal one, bringing them to the light of the cross. I got a couple questions here for you. The first one is this. Have you truly came to Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you come to know the Lord God of Israel? The true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that gave His life for you that you can be forgiven of your sins and that you can look to heaven. Didn't one of those songs that we sang talk about heaven, didn't it? It did. Is that you? Have you come to Jesus? If you haven't, what you, need to do to, what you need to know and understand this morning is that you are a sinner. You see, you've got that haughty heart, that pride that's in you. And God wants to come and change it. He wants to change your life, doesn't He? He wants to do that. You've got to see that you're a sinner and you've got to understand that God left glory and He came in the flesh of a man, Jesus Fully God and fully man, and He died for you. Was buried and rose again. He shed His blood, His life, so that you and I could have life. And that's why that song said, but all through the blood. Nobody comes into heaven but through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and belief in Him. That's where He's calling you to, is to believe and trust what He's done for you. I trust you, Lord. I believe it. I accept it. That's what He calls you to. And if you do that, He saves you this morning. And you can pray that on your own. You can ask Him. You can recognize that. If you've done that this morning, you are saved. But then I want to, I want to speak to those of you that... Who says they're saved here this morning? Raise your hand if you're saved. If you're saved, you come to a relationship with the Lord. I think that's just everybody in the room here. If that's you then... Are you growing in the grace of God? Or are there some things that it's preventing that that we saw with David's life here? Whatever it is, if that's you, if there's something preventing your growth in the Lord, sanctification in Him, you know what He wants you to do? Just like coming up here and speaking and testifying, He wants you to pray to Him. He wants you to recognize that sin and He wants you to make it right. And He wants you to begin now to grow in the grace of God in your life with Him. Each day, you're growing closer to Him. Each day, you're growing closer to Him. You're getting farther away from the world system, closer to Him. That's where He wants you this morning. Where are you? I want to give each of you opportunity just to pray. If you're saved, if you're not saved, He wants you to come to a relationship with Him. If you are saved, He wants you to have the heart that he wants you to have like David had to begin to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You take a little bit of time just pray and then I'll close us down.